you guys really gotta hear this story. So one day I'm cruising along in my three series BMW and I'm enjoying it, living life, loving it, and just having a great old time. When all of a sudden, bang, my temperature gauge rises to the top. I see steam coming out from underneath and all of a sudden the car doesn't quite feel the same. So then it forces me to pull over to the side, in which case then I pop the hood, find out there's something going wrong, don't know what it is, and I just decide to call a tow truck. Share a ride to the dealership, finding out that the thermostat had cracked, spilled antifreeze all over the place and left me stranded on the side of the road and yet to be faced with another large bill. So this just leads me to the conversation about the overabundance of plastic in BMW engine compartments and how the incompatibility with heat and cool just don't make for a good combination. Let's talk about it. So there's been a lot of controversy about the use of plastic in engine compartments by BMW and that being one of the leading causes to mass amounts of unreliability and failure rate increases throughout the brand. Now, people can always make a comment that BMW is leading the way with the use of plastic, and they have for many, many years. Why is it that cars in the 80s didn't have the same problem as cars today? I mean, after all, they use plastic as well. However, do you realize in 1991, they adopted a new technology called plastic injection molds. And the use of plastic injection molds were sold as providing lower cost, lightweight, strength, improved construction and designs that weren't capable with metal parts. It just makes molding a lot easier. And as well, the overall weight reduction improves performance, economy, but the reality, what it really works out to be is the fact that it's lower cost to manufacture, it's lower cost to install because most of the fittings are actually snapped together, so it reduces labor rates, and it just means larger profit margins because it takes labor out of the equation, but they're not charged any less to you as the consumer. So the comment about being lightweight, absolutely true. Plastic is lighter than aluminum and less clips on each end of a pipe means less weight, less waste. However, in reality, what are you really gaining? On a 3,800 pound luxury car, you lose an extra 30 pounds from the engine compartment. What does that really mean at the end of the day? The other comment about being strong, absolutely. Strong when it's brand new, snaps together. It has a certain level of strength incorporated into the polymers. Unfortunately, with heating and cooling cycles, they become more brittle and the flexibility goes away and they just tend to start falling apart. So at the end of the day, are there benefits in using plastic? Absolutely, but put them in body panels, put them on fenders, put them on rockers, put them on mirrors, but don't put them in an engine compartment, at least not in parts that carry coolant, carry oil. That's a disaster waiting to happen. So the trait regarding durability is something that's often marketed as being a positive thing. Picture this. How do you think a piece of plastic will hold up next to a turbocharger that's spinning at speeds up to 150,000 RPM and creating temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees Celsius? Those are the sort of temps that you can see on the hot side of a turbocharger. If you have pieces of plastic in the near vicinity, what do you think that's going to do to plastic? This all leads to things like warping of valve covers, oil pans, radiator necks snapping off, and fittings just coming apart and just becoming brittle or impossible to remove in the event of repair or maintenance. All of this phenomenon is actually known and in the BMW world is called plastic embrittlement. To top it all off, have you ever seen an engine in its natural habitat? That's in a vehicle that's sitting idling. You punch the throttle and an engine tends to torque and you'll notice an engine twists. That's why engines sit on rubber mounts in most cases. So they can twist and they can give. Well, that's normal and that's great. However, can you imagine if that engine now has a stiff plastic cooling line that goes to a radiator that's also stiff in plastic and it's becoming brittle. That twisting engine, but this isn't twisting at the same rate. So what do you end up having is fatigue at the joints. Fatigue, because the engine's twisting. Every time you punch the throttle, you get this, but this is stable, stable and stationary. And this is twist, twist, twist. It's a fragile environment and eventually snapping. Often radiator necks are the, one of the first things to go. So let's examine some of the issues that have evolved from the use of plastic in the engine compartment. So first, let's give you some examples. We'll talk about the BMW N54 engine. That's BMW's first attempt at twin turbocharging back in 2007. Well, there's lots of problems. How about warped valve covers, snap cooling lines, rad necks, thermostats that crack, split, as well as water pumps that also split, crack, start leaking and seeping. And they're very expensive to change because the labor rate is so high and they're very inaccessible. How about the M52 TU engines in the three and five series cars, for example? Thermostats are highly known to split and leak. As well as found in the E36 3 Series BMWs, also thermostats are known to split and leak. Which is actually what I found in my case, because I was driving my E36 3 Series, and coincidentally, that's actually a normal phenomenon. Or there's also that infamous Series 5 and Series 7s cars with split fan shrouds. Those pieces can eventually become brittle, snap off, go into the fan, 
And if you're lucky, you won't have a piece of that fly off into your radiator and cost you even more money. Also in the mid 90s, you talk about 5 series, 7 series cars and the coolant reservoirs, the reservoir that holds the extra antifreeze or coolant in your engine. Those are known to also come apart and separate or split and of course leak. But did you realize that BMW did this intentionally? Not necessarily maliciously, that's not what we're saying because BMW is a great brand and still quite frankly, one of the best driving brands out there. However, it was done for different reasons. It's called recycling and renewable sources. So what they consider is sustainability through recycling. So we can all last a lot longer on this planet without destroying the resources. So as of 1990, BMW actually started a network of recycling facilities with basically an intent to capture all of the end of life vehicles, strip them down, remove the chemicals, the oils, the antifreezes, coolants, brake fluids, all those toxic chemicals, strip all the extra pieces off them, throw them in a big mulching machine, grind it all up and regurgitate it into some reusable product. But did you know that in current BMWs, over 15% of the actual car is made of recycled plastic. Now, is it recycled plastic that actually goes back into your engine for critical cooling parts? For the most part, not so much. A lot of this recycled plastic goes into places like the undercarriage guards. It goes into the back shelf there behind your rear window. It goes into a lot of those extraneous parts that are also made of plastic, but not so critical. But where it becomes a bigger problem is where they see the sustainability side of it and they know there's a great use for recycled plastic, it creates an engineering exercise to develop more parts that wouldn't normally cr be created with the use of plastic, now are now being engineered as plastic replacement for metallics, for example, like aluminum. So now they're developing more and more plastic. So this all sounds very, very good from an environmentalist perspective. And honestly, there's lots of people that do agree with the concept and in theory, it's really, really good. However, BMW in some cases, in my opinion, has lost sight of what is actually important and some of the parts do have an engineered lifespan and unfortunately that usually means somewhere in that three to five year time frame and that usually means cars that are just getting out of warranty start to see these failures. So you start seeing water pumps and radiators and expansion tanks as well as thermostats. All of these parts start to break down slowly with time and by the time you have a 10 year old vehicle, you've changed everything over at least once, maybe twice. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm gonna stop buying BMWs? Absolutely not. I am not boycotting the brand. As a matter of fact, I wish they could get on the wagon with rethinking the whole principles of creating those parts that are critical and make them out of more robust materials, possibly aluminum. Now, there are obviously certain limits with metals as well, but with all of the engineering expertise we have today, we would hope that they could come up with better solutions and make cars a little more durable. After all, BMW is seriously one of the best automotive brands for the true automotive enthusiasts who enjoy the drive. And with saying that, I'm sure you guys want to know which engines are the most reliable in the BMW lineup. Definitely want to check that video out. It's really going to help you guys along if that's what you're curious about. Hope to see you guys on the next video. Can't wait to see you then. Bye-bye.